Chapter 7, So-Called Situational Sexual Behavior. Quote, Did you see Colonel Gaddafi at the UN complaining that American soldiers have been sodomizing Arab boys? I thought, well, that's been the case since the very beginning of the Republic. They blame the sodomy on those great forests out there, which they said made them horny. There was nothing else to do but bugger boys, they said, end quote. We have seen that relationships between men are neither confined to an effeminate minority nor to a single culture. Masculine men of different eras and empires have loved each other spanning all continents. Moreover, they are unaware of each other's existence. The Hawaiians of the 18th century knew nothing about the Greco-Roman world, while Luke and Stephen could have hardly known about either. And likewise, blissfully unaware of others were the warrior monks of Tibet. If separate cultures across time and space had invented the same tool without collaboration, we would either claim space alien conspiracy, if we're crazy, or that a commonality was a sign of some innate capacity, as is the case with language. And while the specifics of languages differ in vocabulary, we recognize that humans nonetheless have an inborn capacity for language in general. Along similar lines, that men love men should be a banality no more controversial than that humans can learn to speak languages or walk on two feet. But the acknowledgement of the universal love between masculine men faces roadblocks, silence, or excuses. The history deniers ignore the obvious in hopes that if we don't give it any attention, the indecent monster will slink away. Euphemistically described as the love that dare not speak its name, same-sex relationships of all kinds were shrouded in silence, interrupted only with sporadic bouts of hysteria and moral panics. I remember an old and read world encyclopedia from the 1960s that did not even have an entry for homosexuality. In Edith, in Edith Hamilton's famous mythology from the 1940s, Zeus's boyfriend Ganymede receives minor billing as a, quote, beautiful tr young Trojan prince who was seized and carried to Olympus by Zeus's eagle, end quote, but absent are any sexual implications. Maybe Zeus wanted a beautiful cupbearer because lifting a cup was too much trouble for a god. Maybe not. 19th century translations of ancient texts leave in Latin the descriptions of sex acts while medical books in the vernacular translate them into Latin, although such censorship may have had the unintended consequence of arousing more curiosity. While ignoring history to marginalize taboos is infuriating, quite amusing and comical are the excuses of those who wish to explain away and cover up the past ubiquitous same-sex relationships. The argument is that none of these people were real homosexuals. This, this is true, but this true but irrelevant non sequitur misses the point that their relationships with men were genuine regardless of their sex with women. Political correctness, sometimes even promoted by oblivious gays themselves, disparages such same-sex relationships by doubting their authenticity. Allegedly straight men getting hard to gay porn? It's just a reflex. Roman emperors having sex with, with other men? Women were not invented until 47 6 AD. Native and Aboriginal peoples engaged in constant same-sex sex? They're faking it for their hokey-pokey tribal rituals. The excuse has many variations, but generally goes under the name situational homosexuality or situ situational same-sex behavior, the greatest lie invented against masculinity. And you know, situational, like something that only occurs in limited circumstances, like on all continents across millennia. Those who provide these fanciful excuses generally make the following circular argument. Because most men are naturally inclined to women, any instance of them having sex with another man is situational, outside the ordinary. They're not real homosexuals, just heterosexual beings who engage in homosexual acts in much the same way that a professional dermatologist was born that way and is merely and is merely engaging in culinary acts when preparing dinner. LeVay and Dover. Simon LeVay, a neuroscientist in Gay, Straight, and the Reason Why, writes, quote, In some cultures, unmarried women have been sequestered and thus invisible to men and unobtainable as sex partners. In such environments, male adolescents were often sought after as sex partners by adult men, especially by young, unmarried men. 
Ancient Greece is a particularly well-known example, so much so that Greek love has long been used as a colloquial term for homosexuality. A more recent example was the same-sex culture that existed in Afghanistan under the Taliban when all women were hidden behind their burqas. I like boys, but I like girls better, one Kandahar resident told the Los Angeles Times. It's just that we can't see the women to see if they're beautiful, but we can see the boys, and so we can tell which of them is beautiful. Uh, end quote. About half of all men in Kandahar engaged in sex with boys at one time or another, according to one local medical professor interviewed for the article. In such cultures, the choice of adolescent boys as partners probably reflects the fact that these youths lacking beards and adult musculature are closer to women in appearance than are adult men. Thus, it would be quite wrong to assert that many or most men in ancient Greece or in Afghanistan were homosexual in the sense of having a strong preference for males when given the choice of sexual partners. What these cultures do demonstrate is the degree to which sexual desire and sexual behavior accommodate themselves to a restricted range of options, just as they do in prisons and other single-sex environments today." End quote on that excerpt. Or they demonstrate completely the opposite, that maybe our culture is the one that's quite restricted. First, many Greeks did choose women, not necessarily over women. Okay. First, many Greeks did, not, did choose men not necessarily over women, but despite the presence of women. The idea that women are, were unavailable is outright false. Many vases and plates bear witness to women freely fucking men, youths, or each other lesbianic, lesbianically. Second, notice how Islam's homophobia is not mentioned as a limiting factor of same-sex behavior, while the alleged homosexuality is merely considered some accidental byproduct of Islam's misogynist segregation. Islam forbids the very open relationships that the coining of the word grero encourages, so why are we to assume that the only same-sex relationships are those that are due to segregation? Why is only restricting heterosexuality the only bias mentioned? That oversight makes the argument rather circular. It assumes that only exclusive heterosexuality is valid, and thus anything else is an aberration that must be a result of suppressed heterosexuality. Same-sex love cannot exist for its own sake. Its experience must be a heterosexual dysfunction. This from an openly gay scientist. Third, it's not true that the preference for young men is really pseudo-heterosexual, whereby the younger male is a stand-in for a woman. Has Simon LeVay never seen teenaged males, or for that matter, women? The only thing young men have in common with women that neither shares with men is that neither has facial hair most of the time. Given that sports are a big deal in high school, the musculature of young men is often much better than that of well-marbled hams that some adults morph into. The reason for the preference of younger men is precisely because they are physically at the peak of masculinity. Masculine young men are quite the opposite of feminine, Rubenesque women. The preference for such young men needs as much explanation as the preference of filet over hamburger or swordfish over swampy catfish. Dover, in his book Greek Homosexuality, perhaps the first work to comprehensively examine the topic, routinely makes the same mistake. Describing vase R712 as men and youths accost women, Dover draws note to the physical similarities of the youths and women as if to agree with LeVay that the young men were pseudo-heterosexual substitutes for women. Dover is correct in his observation, though. The youths and women do look alike. However, this does not support the desired conclusions, as the women have broad shoulders and narrow hips. Whether we have a bad artist or one enamored by the masculine form, we can conclude that the young men aren't proxies for women. The idea that such beautiful bodies need, uh, need some sort of excuse to be appreciated isn't just plainly incorrect, but also quite oblivious. What's so damn unattractive about a young, fit male? Mondamore. Describing the ancient Greeks more or less accurately in the first chapter to A Natural History of Homosexuality, Mondamore makes the following conclusion, quote, 
These men were not homosexual, not in the modern meaning of that term. The Greeks had no such word or concept. It is perhaps more correct to say that the Greeks practiced a sort of bisexuality in that, for men at least, sexual activity with partners of both sexes was accepted." End quote. This is an acceptable conclusion. However, when explaining the current scientific theories on the origins of sexual orientation, Mondamore lets it slip that the real homosexuals in ancient Greece probably did not stand out because everyone was more or less into same-sex sex, even though most were real heterosexuals. Quote, a homosexual person might look different in different cultures. Among the Greeks, the existence of homosexuality has been described as being submerged within cultural mores. Those for whom same-sex intimacy was consistently and compellingly more satisfying than heterosexual relationships did not stand out from the majority. For ancient Greeks, perhaps, uh, for ancient Greeks, perhaps homosexual intimacy was merely a pleasant sensual diversion from what they experienced as the real thing, heterosexual intimacy. Such ill-informed musing seeks to pigeonhole the Greeks, uh, end quote. Such ill-informed musing seeks to pigeonhole the Greeks into our sexual orientation framework instead of us recognizing that our framework cannot be universal as we presume it is if it does not describe other cultures well. Again, to think that men in Greece chose men or women over the other is the wrong paradigm, which at least Mondamore acknowledges before in the previous quote but for some reason abandoned later on. Such speculation may be from the bias that Mondamore himself, like LaVey, is gay and cannot fathom that most men do indeed like other men, at least in the absence of our culture. Frost. The absurdities reach their zenith with a short college textbook entitled Greek Society. After mentioning Zeus and Ganymede and numerous vase paintings attesting to plenty of same-sex sex, Frost casually dismisses all of that with, quote, Actually, the proportion of Greeks, both male and female, whose sexual orientation was unambiguously homosexual, was probably the same as in any other human population in the history of the human race, end quote. Probably the same? What's the evidence aside from mere assertion? And what's with the straw man, Frost? No one argues that most of the Greeks were gay, but that their more diverse sexual appetites contrast jarringly to today's narrower cultural restrictions. Instead of using the Greeks to ponder our own culture's limitation, Frost tries to pigeonhole them into ours. To explain away the amount of same-sex sex with the Greeks, Frost argues, quote, Greek boys and young men were by the very structure of society thrown together from childhood on in schools and gymnasium and in military training. It was perhaps only natural that attachment would form and sometimes develop into same-sex love. This has been true of every society we know in which an artificial, exclusively male grouping has been part of the normal structure. It's simple, really. An artificial group, whatever that means, that's part of the normal structure, whatever that means, can create attachment between men. It's only natural, but also completely artificial. The bad choice of words betrays the faulty logic. In Frost's world, artificial begets natural. That seems contradictory, but we have more. The evidence of the artificiality of these natural same-sex attachments is that they happen in every society that has such conditions. How can a constant feature of every society be artificial? By definition, something that occurs in a variety of cultures must be indicative of more than just that single culture. But to Frost, the exceptionless universality of same-sex attractions proves that they are in fact artificial. The gist is that they're not the gist is that they're not really into other guys. Culture forced them. Of course, our culture's homophobia is not even a topic worthy of discussion. To recap, a culture that merely allows for same-sex attractions to flourish is biased. Our own culture that actively discourages and penalizes such acts is the unmentioned standard by which everything shall be measured against. Zero self-awareness. Frost also claims that social conditioning was responsible. Quote, There were strong incentives and peer pressure inducing young men to court each other. End quote. 
Let's suppose I argue against the innateness of the idea that most men are attracted to women by pointing out that the very structure of society has forced men and women to marry per societal custom. Men and women are told from an early age that they should marry someone of the opposite sex. In every such society that has exerted such pressure, we in fact see marriage. Therefore, most men aren't really attracted to women. That's about as stupid as what Frost is trying to sell. Why is his book in fifth edition? Who, who do I talk to in order to get such a cushy deal? None of these succeed in explaining anything, but they sure wind up in a self-contradiction. How can a genuine heterosexual man have any sex with other men outside of genuine coercion or rape and still be considered heterosexual? Am I to believe these womenless men don't know how to masturbate? Alone, of course, not each other. And if sex with men is preferable to no sex at all or just masturbation, isn't that admission alone that to scrap the concept of heterosexuality? You don't get to round up from mostly or primarily heterosexual to bona fide heterosexual. Prison rape. At the beginning, LeVay mentioned the artificiality of prison rape. But even something as seemingly situational as prison rape can tell us about the absurdity of the current system. Along the lines of young men acting as a stand-in for women, prison sex, whether consensual for both or not, is often thought as a situational and, qua uh, situational and quasi-heterosexual. Even if non-consensual, one, one partner, usually the top, is willing to have sex with another man. Since the aggressor will most likely be the top, this is dismissed as quasi-heterosexual, mimicking the alleged heteronormative norm of the active male and passive female. But if we're redefining heterosexuality to include not just penis vagina, but penis whole, then we have to readjust the definition of heterosexuality's parallel homosexuality. So are men who exclusively have sex with other men, but are always the tops heterosexual now? Would the gay top in a gay relationship be, be considered heterosexual by the sa same standard? If penis plowing any hole equals heterosexual, then certainly tops must be heterosexuals. What about men who don't have anal sex but are tops orally or other positions with only other men? Mostly men, sometimes men. What about men who are primarily tops but not exclusively with only other men? Mostly men, sometimes men. What about men whose wives fuck them with strap-ons every once in a while? What percentage is the cutoff? Is it homosexual for a man to be fucked by his wife? For whom if the wife is the heterosexual male and the husband the heterosexual female? And what if he's a total top with other men? Mostly top, etc. Shifting the goalposts for heterosexuality but neglecting to do the same for homosexuality is special pleading. Such redefinitions that seek to rescue the concept of heterosexuality by gener generously expanding it have a domino effect that shows the absurdity of it all. Conclusion. It's pretty clear that the hetero-homo paradigm, paradigm can neither stand up nor be rescued without collapsing. So by radically redefining heterosexuality as to allow some homosexual contact, as long as it's arbitrarily defined to be not real, situational homosexuality destroys the very definition of heterosexuality it seeks to, uh, seeks to rescue. Heterosexuality is not men have sex with women, but sometimes also men given such and such criteria. If I say that I'm not prone to anger, but only if someone drops a bowling ball on my foot, we are saying that my anger is in fact innate, but only in certain circumstances. So the excuse of situational homosexuality is another way of saying that same-sex desires are natural, but only in certain circumstances. That's why we get the Freudian slip from Frost in that most awkward construction that, that proposes artificial conditions, an all-male military giving rise to an already existent natural essence, the attraction to men. The brazen hypocrisy and double standards evaporate what little remains of situational homosexuality. Why is it that heterosexuality is never situational, or rather only for gays? You know, those poor gay saps who wanted to be just like everyone else with a wife, kids, white fence, and a normal dog but they realize it's all a farce and then get invited onto the Oprah show. 
Why don't we say men have sex with women in situations A, B, and C, while men, while with men in situations D, E, and F? Why the double standard? Why are only same-sex relationships marked as situational? Situational homosexuality fails because it, because it is circular and assumes what it seeks to prove. Most are exclusively heterosexual, therefore anything that debunks this must be false.